To remain updated with the latest business news, click on the bell icon. Hello and welcome to Business Today. I am Siddharth Zarabi. On the show today is a rather unique topic. The art of bitfulness, keeping calm in the digital world. It's actually the title of a book authored by Nandan Nilikani, who we all know as the co-founder and chairman of Infosys Technologies and also as the chief architect and former chairman of the unique identification authority of India that gave us the Aadhaar number. Also with us on the show today, Tanuj Bhojwani, a fellow at the iSpirit Foundation and the co-author of this book. Welcome to the show, Nandan uh, and Tanuj. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, book. I barely uh, had time to go through it, but I must show it to our uh, viewers. And uh, Thank you. bitfulness, keeping calm, seem like oxymorons in this hyper-connected world, Nandan. How did you think of this book? Uh, uh, something to do with the pandemic and uh, all the thoughts that came during that period? Oh, definitely this book is uh, directly related to the pandemic. I think in the pandemic, uh, our digital intensity of everything we did, we did all entertainment relationships, food ordering, e-commerce, everything on, on a digital device meetings using all these video platforms. And uh, to break the monotony, I began a walk in the park once the parks opened up, where every morning I would do a one-hour walk and I would meet somebody, both of us would wear masks and you know talk about things. And uh, Tanuj was one of the persons I would meet on these walks. And we both came to the realization that while this whole thing was so demanding, both of us had independently developed ways and means to we use, use digital in a in a hygienic way, in a way that we could we don't get overwhelmed. And though we had very different details, the conceptually it was the same. And that's when it hit us to create a book which will sort of tell people that look, technology is here to stay, but how do you make it work for you instead of you working for it? And that's what led to this book, Siddharth. Nandan, I remember a time when the first SMSs were. Uh, sent in India as a reporter and one of the things that was a sort of self-limiting uh, 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 feature for sending SMSs was the cost attached with it versus That's WhatsApp right. and everything else which is free. Uh, is this an issue of global social media platforms driving herds of consumers towards this normal or is this actually adding uh, to our uh, to the quality of our life? Well, I think what has happened is one is everything has become free. So you, you don't have to pay. So there's no money associated with these things. So of course, you're paying for your attention and so on. The second thing is that everything is at your fingertips. So you have all the apps in the world at your fingertips and you can change your, change your app anytime you want. And, and, and you have lots of choices. You have the tyranny of choice. So when you have all these things, if you're not careful, you can get completely subsumed in that. And at the same time, you know, some people say, give up your devices and become a monk. That's also not possible. And therefore, our whole book is about the fact that we recognize that digital is very much part of our lives. In fact, both Tanuj and I, our entire professional life has been in digital transformation. But we have to make technology work for you. So that's why we call this book as not anti-tech, but pro-you. I'm sure uh, uh, coming from you, it's certainly not uh, anti-tech. Uh, I'll come back to you with a few questions, Nandan, but I want to go to uh, Tanuj. Tanuj, make it simple uh, for our viewers. If I were to ask you for a listicle uh, approach of defining the problems, uh, how would you respond? Uh, to define the problem, I think it's very easy. We are connected all the time anywhere and we confuse that with the necessity to be connected all the time everywhere. Um, we, we just don't know anymore how to switch off. Um, a lot of people believe that how can I live or work without the internet? That is true. We are not asking you to give it up. What we are asking is, do you actually have control over your time, attention and data? Or is somebody else designing uh, I, your I'm life around I'm going to interrupt you technology? here, Tanuj, uh, because uh, you said two trigger words really, switching off and do you have control over your time? A lot of our viewers would argue that they don't have neither. 
meaning that they can't switch off because they don't have control over their time. So what is the point in even advocating that, Tanu, just to challenge this argument that you made? Absolutely. I think uh, there is the, the idea that we have in this book, and we say this is that, look, you might be busy uh, and it's not just work. Parenting is something that takes time. Uh, you could have pandemic-related upsets, health upsets that take away your time. But the question comes down to this. Even if you manage to find a pocket of one hour uh, in a day that is truly yours, have do we even have the ability anymore to look away from our screens, to not mindlessly scroll, to not go to YouTube, to not do uh, you know autoplay, but instead actually use that one hour for something that will bring us long-term joy. And I think somewhere the instant fix of the internet, the instant hit of the internet is taking away that ability from all of us. And it's time we start recognizing that and stepping back and fixing things because fixing is possible. That's what Nandan and I discovered in the pandemic as we struggled ourselves. Uh, my own personal story is that I used to be extremely fat. I used to be about 105 kilos. Um, and, you know, in the pandemic, not just writing this book and gratefulness, but also lost about 30 kilos because I took back control of my time. You that's know, that, 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 that's absolutely time fantastic. Your weight loss uh, is an inspiration in itself and this book as well for many uh, readers. But we are currently uh, in what would be called uh, the the internet that was imagined 20, 30 years back and has kept evolving. And we are now on the cusp of what is being called uh, Web3, uh, the metaverse, choose what you may want to call it. Uh, given what's happened currently, uh, Tanuj, uh, isn't life going to get even more uh, difficult uh, bit by bit in the future? Uh, very good point. It is threatening to be which is why we need to have a conversation on culture, hygiene, well-being uh, in the digital space. In the past, whenever you had any network technology, like say cities came together instead of villages, anything that became bigger in scale, we had more complex problems like pandemics, like uh, pollution, like uh, sewage, uh, but we fixed them. We fixed each one of them and we are much better than we were today. Digital, like you said, is 20 to 30 years old, which in the scale of history is nothing. It's time we start having that conversation about when the whole world comes together on one platform, how do we behave? How do we keep our attention, our time, our data to ourselves? And then I'm coming back to you. Uh, uh, we, we are speaking at a time when Microsoft, which one would call the originator of uh, all things tech uh, software in some ways, has gone ahead and made a massive uh, purchase and acquisition, which is perhaps the largest, that is of a gaming company and it's all somehow tying up into the metaverse we know what facebook's done and what the other players are lining up for can you simplify this new world uh, is it a world in which all of us ordinarily even outside the restrictions uh, due to the pandemic will have headsets we'll be talking to our family through uh, uh, in virtual reality and living lives more in the metaverse than normal uh, human lives uh, that's a great question. Uh, let me just explain uh, what's happening here. Uh, the Fundamentally, I think Microsoft has done a remarkable thing in buying this uh, company, Activision Blizzard, and uh, this actually makes them into a huge uh, gaming player. As you know, they already have a lot of gaming platforms, uh, Minecraft, uh, they have the, uh, you know, the Xbox, which is very successful. So I think this, this will, once it's approved, will consolidate their position in the gaming area. And the gaming in the world is being driven by three companies. One is by Sony with the PlayStation. The other is uh, 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 Tencent, which owns a lot of the applications uh, in China. And then, of course, uh, Microsoft. Uh, so I think it solidifies that. Now, the metaverse is a slightly more abstract idea where everything is in the metaverse, not just gaming. So you work in the metaverse, you play in the metaverse, you do commerce in the metaverse, you have relationships in the metaverse. And many years back, there was a you know platform called Second Life, which offered an early version of that. So I think uh, it's both a play on gaming and a longer term play on the metaverse. And uh, the question is, of course, whether how much of our time we want to spend in that kind of a digital universe and how much we want to spend in the physical world. So I think... Again, it's about finding that balance. And our book is ultimately about finding this balance, about figuring out what you can do 
When do you need to work with what you call as the create mode? When do you need to, you know, read or watch something? We call that as curate mode. And when you need to communicate with people and there are different modes. And if you can operate in different modes and you know you're in that mode, then you're likely to be more calmer and therefore more productive. Nandan, what have been the hits and misses uh, in the last two decades? And the reason I'm asking you this is not for a recap, but for looking ahead um, uh, 2022 and beyond in the Indian context. And allow me to add uh, two points here. Uh, we'd be, we'd thought 20 years back that telemedicine would mean that the delivery of healthcare services and their availability in rural India would fundamentally change. We have seen some of it happen, but I think, and you perhaps would agree with me, it's not a, a massive change yet. Why has that not happened? I could give you many more examples. Tech has made changes. Banking payments have been completely revolutionized, but many things haven't happened. Why is this? Is this because technology is being adopted and not just adopted, being designed for the well-off, for the rich, for the upper crust and all these big massive corporations aren't keeping the arm army, the small man uh, in mind? I think a number of factors. That first is, of course, uh, the technology itself has to be very simple, easy to use, cheap and so on. So that's one part. But also, there's always a time for technology. And, uh, you know, if there's, if there's social change which is happening, then the technology gets, gets adopted. I mean, look at all of us in the last two years, we have done more video conferences than we have ever done in our lives. And today, uh, a 90-year-old grandmother is talking to her grandson uh, over Zoom. So I think that behavior change has been forced. I do believe that uh, teleconsultation on health has gone up uh, quite a bit uh, during the pandemic because people didn't want to meet the doctor face to face. We don't know whether that will be an enduring uh, behavior habit or it will it'll come back when things get better. Uh, but, you know, sometimes also because technology tends to be uh, overestimated. For example, autonomous cars, you know, for the last several years, people are saying any, any year now we'll have autonomous cars that don't need drivers and they can drive on their own. But people are finding that autonomous cars is a technology which seems to be far more difficult than sending a rocket into space. And now the estimates for autonomous cars are now looking over the next decade. On the other hand, people thought that electric batteries would take a long time, but a lot of the advances in electric batteries made by people like Tesla, suddenly the electric batteries are now coming price, uh, price comparable with internal combustion engines. So sometimes the pace of change also matters. So it's pace of change, government push, uh, innovation by entrepreneurs, institutions to make it happen, and some big market or social need. So some, some things happen and some things don't happen. And we have to be constantly looking out for that. Nandan, who will be the champions of tomorrow uh, from uh, India? You know, 40, uh, four decades back, uh, uh, you, uh, your company was uh, getting off, I remember, visiting the campus uh, in the late 90s and being completely bowled over. Today, if I were to ask you, who are the champions of the future as far as India is concerned? For example, uh, why don't we have a Zoom? Uh, and you know, there could be many more such examples that we could talk about. Well, I think first of all, uh, you know, we already have huge uh, companies uh, like Infosys, which are going to be playing an even more important role in the world. So that's one part of it. But also, I think India is going to have a large number of SaaS companies, people who use the cloud and uh, software as a service and offer solutions around the world. And we are seeing people like uh, Freshworks having a very successful IPO uh, in, in NASDAQ. So that's a big class of companies. And the third is going to be companies that are bent on transforming the Indian market. So now you have uh, uh, startups in every field uh, you know, I mean, uh, reading about a startup that's aggregating the sale of eggs. Uh, you're seeing about startups in healthcare, in education, in uh, in in social commerce, in in accounting, in in you know, in helping small business get better. So I think we're going to see a lot of great companies come out of that. And the good news is that they will play a very very important role in improving uh, uh, the productivity of Indians, in reducing the friction, and helping the economic growth. And what has also happened is that the Indian infrastructure, the India stack, Aadhaar, 1.3 billion people with 50 million authentications a day, 
uh, UPI with 4.5 billion transactions a month, value more than 100 billion. The account aggregator, which allows you to empower people with their own data. The fast tag, which has dramatically improved speed of movement on highways. So all these population scale infrastructure also is making a big difference in India. Nandan, I've always wanted to ask you this. When you uh, were putting in place uh, uh, Aadhaar, did it ever strike you that you could actually use the mobile phone numbers, use SIM cards and uh, kind of develop that further uh, uh, as an as a, as a identity number rather than just a paper card? I'm not trying to deride what has been done. I'm just asking you this tech question because we had this massive no, number of SIM cards already which has more than doubled since then. No, no. Obviously, we, we looked at all the options uh, that were there. We looked at passport, SIM card, everything. But we realized there was a root ID which we had to identify with an individual which was inviolate. That this, this number is this person's number and this person has this number. And mobile numbers don't do that because mobile numbers can keep changing. Somebody can have multiple phones. In those days with prepaid phones, people were kept replacing the SIM cards. In any case, to get the SIM card, you have to do an ID check. So, you know, so finally, actually, it's complementary. For example, one of the biggest reasons for the mobile expansion, especially after Jio came, was electronic KYC using Aadhaar. So you use Aadhaar to do the root KYC of a person and then issue a mobile phone to him. So that's why, you know, if we talk about the Jam Trinity, Jandan Aadhaar Mobile is the bank account number, the Aadhaar number, and the mobile number. All three represent three different things. All three together provide the foundational trinity for Indians. What should Aadhaar 2.0 be, if at all? Well, I think uh, obviously it has to become much more real time. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, when we did it, it was a batch process and it, it would take you several weeks to get your Aadhaar. Now they cut that down to a few days and ultimately they'll go to real time. Uh, they need to bring in more authentication and they have to find more use cases. I personally believe that one of the big use cases is going to be in electricity reforms. Because if we want our electric companies to become uh, healthy, then we have to separate the delivery of electricity from the subsidy. So we have to do a direct cash transfer like we do in LPG. And we need our electricity companies to be healthy. If we're going to completely go to a electric vehicle and electric two-wheeler market, we need really good power supply. So I think applying Aadhaar to new areas like DBT for electricity is something I would look at. Is Elon Musk fair in saying that he's facing challenges in India just because the government is not giving him free, uh, duty-free imports of his uh, fully built cars into India? I think the government has excellent policies for, uh, you know, completely built units, CBO units being brought in. The government has an excellent uh, production incentive. And I'm sure we have all the necessary infrastructure which any company can avail of. Why do you think the government and the RBI have not yet been able to finalize a regulation on crypto? The reason I ask you this is, you yourself have a chapter about that in the book. And more importantly, many youngsters that I know uh, are dabbling, uh, putting even amounts as small as 5, uh, 2,000, 10,000 rupees and risking a lot of their money. Yes, I think that the reason is that I think on crypto, we have really uh, two sort of two schools of thought. One is the more conservative school of thought that crypto as should be banned because they are cryptocurrencies and issuing the currency is a fiat responsibility only the government can issue and therefore we should ban crypto. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that crypto is not a currency really because you can't really transact so well with it, but it's an asset class. And if we can regulate it as an asset class and allow people to buy and sell these assets just like they buy and sell shares, then there's a whole new asset class worth $2 trillion that they can participate in. And as you rightly said, youngsters like it because they can go on to a 24 by 7 crypto market and buy and sell crypto, uh, unlike other stock markets that are only for a limited number of hours per day. So I think my, my I am here under the view that crypto as an asset class, we should permit, but they should follow all the laws, whether it's a KYC, PMLA, money laundering, income tax, everything they have to follow. But it should be allowed as an asset class. Fair point. My last question, and this is for uh, Tanuj, I noticed that there are uh, several pages devoted to how one should communicate. Make it simple for us because 
uh, you you've spoken about multiple formats just too many ways of messaging that we have what should that communication plan be uh, for those who are uh, watching this show uh it's something that nandan and i discovered we have in common the idea of inbox zero uh for every message have you know option 1 2 3 4 that this is all i'll do with a message if you've seen the message need to give a quick reply just send a thumbs up or an okay uh if it is irrelevant delete or even better if it's a you know constant newsletter kind of thing unsubscribe once and for all uh if it takes less than 2 minutes just do it just reply just send it out there and if it's a longer task requires you to think put it on your calendar make time for it uh, don't make a to do list which you will never get to uh so the simple rule of communication is touch it once and clear it um and do this across everything your email your whatsapp um in my whatsapp i archive messages so that if i open whatsapp and you know uh, nobody has messaged me it will look blank you know i don't have the old messages from which i'm going uh try to end conversations things in the digital end just keep going on uh, try to just close a conversation and put it away put it out of your mind absolutely tanuj and i hope uh, people uh... take your advice uh, and go through this fantastic book i'm going to get more into it but as i wind up this conversation it's very very important we we need to be digital we need to adapt to newer technologies but we have to perhaps do it in a very careful and calibrated manner nandan nilakini and tanuj bhojwani thank you very much for your time with us today with that it's a wrap on this interesting conversation if you been thank you very much for watching If you like the video do like comment share and subscribe